All right, today I'm joined by Neil Winokur. Now, he's an accountant from Toronto, but he's also written a book and it's called The Grumpy Accountant. It's a bit like that classic book, The Wealthy Barber, but in this case, it focuses on going through the maze of tax rules in Canada. And I wanted you to hold on for just a second here because that sounds like it'd be boring and frustrating, but it's not. It's funny. This book is funny. I read it on my deck this summer. I read the whole thing in one sitting and laughed like a crazy person because it's really, really funny. So do yourself a favor, go and buy the book. Well, listen to the podcast first, then buy the book. But in any case, we've got Neil Whitaker here. He wrote the book. So I wanted to talk to him, the grumpy accountant himself. Neil, thanks for jumping on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so let's jump into the book, because this isn't just a textbook about tax rules. That'd be boring. I'd want to die reading that. This is a <laughs> funny story about a guy named Jerry, and it goes through his life and all of the tax nonsense he has to live with. He's, he gets to know an accountant named George. He's the grumpy accountant, explains to Jerry all of the nonsense that he has to go through with the tax code. So let's start at the first point. Because I think a lot of us can identify with this. You get a job, you think in your head, here's how much I make per hour. Here's how much money I'm going to have. I'm so excited. I get the paycheck and it's way less than you thought. Talk about Jerry's experience getting his first paycheck. Yeah, that's how the book starts out. Um, the book tries to go through kind of the typical life cycle of a typical Canadian. So it starts out Jerry he has his first two weeks of work and it's payday and he gets his check and he's very confused because what he calculates to be what his gross pay should be, uh, the actual check is a lot less. So he looks at the pay stub and he doesn't know what all these letters are, CPP, EI, income tax, all these deductions. And he's, he remembers vaguely like, oh yeah, taxes. He remembers his parents complaining of high taxes. But he never imagined that this would ever happen to him, right? So he eventually, he, you know, he's very sad. And he goes to a party that night with his friends. And he meets a girl named Elaine. And Elaine has an accountant named George. And Jerry meets George. And George explains to him how his pay stub works. That You know, he explains what CPP is and EI and income tax. So through the stories that I tell throughout The Grumpy Accountant, um, one can when we'll really learn more about our tax system, it really, the book serves as a really good refresher and introduction uh, to the Canadian tax system. Uh, and when we see Jerry experience this at every stage in life. Yeah, it's a funny thing because uh, you get used to it. Somehow you stop noticing it. Like don't tell Mel who does all of the uh, payroll uh, here at the Taxpayers Federation, but I forget to look at my pay stub all the time you forget how much is being taken off there. So when you see Jerry just get hit with that in the face, it's actually kind of a good reminder. But let's move on to sort of the next point. He gets a big tax refund. Great news. That's happy news. Everybody likes getting a, a big tax refund, but his accountant, George, just goes off on a rant about it. Why is George <laughs> so upset that he gets a tax refund? Well, George is upset about this tax refund, and George explains why he's upset, because what the tax refund really represents is it shows that actually the government was taking too much money off of every paycheck, and now they're giving it back to you, but they really should not have taken it in the first place. If the tax system was more, if it was simpler, we wouldn't have deductions that are too high and then you get it back at the end of the year so this is one of my big pet peeves of our tax system it's actually very it's like this sort of evil genius that the government came up with they want people to file their tax returns every year and not only do they want you to file they want you to look forward to it so what they do is they say okay we're going to give everyone big tax refunds and that way people look forward to filing their tax return but if you're receiving a big, huge tax refund every year, um, all that means is your paycheck really should be higher. Your net pay that you receive should be higher throughout the year. And there are actually ways, and I provide these tips in the book, there are ways to actually have your employer deduct less tax throughout the year. 
Um, there are legal ways of doing that. And George explains that in the book. But the, the main point is that what the government does here is they require a certain standard amount of income tax to be deducted from every single paycheck. But people have deductions and credits that they claim when they file their tax return, which really reduces the amount of tax they have to pay. And therefore, you're entitled back to some of that money. They took off too much tax, and now the government's giving back to you. And, and there are some people that understand this kind of sleight of hand, this game that the government's playing with your paycheck. But most people don't really think about it. They don't realize it. And because they're getting back like a nice huge chunk of money at tax time, I think the average tax refund that the government sends out is around $1,800 or I forget if it's $1,200 or $1,800, but that's a lot of money for most people. And they're very excited to receive that. So they never really ask the question, oh, maybe like I shouldn't be receiving a big tax refund. Maybe I'd rather this cash flow throughout the year. Yeah, it is a real bizarro world kind of a situation where the government takes too much of your money, then gives you back the money, and then you're supposed to be happy. But people are. They get their tax refund. They're like, ah, I'm buying a kayak or whatever. And you're happy right. about it. If any other organization did this to you, overcharged <laughs> you every two weeks for the whole year, and then finally sent you the money back and said, hey, you should be happy about it, you'd be calling the manager. And losing it on them because yeah. why were you being overcharged? But due to the complexity of the tax code, that happens all the time. And, and we just and, stop noticing it. Right. And they're not paying you interest because it, so what it really is, a tax refund really is you're giving an interest free loan to the government. So it's not a good practice unless you're a charity and, and you're giving for free, like a free loan society. Why are you giving interest free loans to the government? It doesn't make sense, but that's how the system works. And you could actually take it a step further. Like your analogy of if any other company did this to you, you would call the manager right away. Right? So imagine if a company said to you, okay, you have to file a bill. We're not going to send you the bill. You have to file it. And we're not going to tell you how much you owe. You have to calculate it yourself. And maybe you owe money. Maybe we owe you money. And by the way, there's a lot of rules on how to calculate this bill. In fact, it's um, a 3,000 page rule book. Okay. And you're, you're probably won't be able to figure it out on your own. So you have to spend hundreds of dollars a year to hire a bill filing professional to help you file the bill. And we could reassess your past, you know, 10 years of bills in case you made a mistake. You'd be like, what? I'm not going to deal with this company. I'll just go to another company where they just send me the bill and I just pay it, right? So really the whole system um, needs a complete revamp. And that's what the Grumpy Canon is about. It offers my ideas on, you know, a massive, complete simplification of the system once and for all. It's interesting that you talk about the fact that you, the government expects you to know that thousands of pages of rules. If you get them wrong, if they make a mistake and you're overcharged, hey, good news for you. You get a refund and you're supposed to pretend to be happy about that. If you make a mistake and owe them money, interest and penalties bang on right away. And then the nightmare scenario, which poor Jerry gets hit with in the book, mm -hmm. an audit. He gets a notice, might be a mistake. There's an audit. He freaks out and goes to his buddy, George, the grumpy account to figure it out. Tell us that story. Yeah, people receive these very scary brown envelopes from the CRA in the mail, and they open it up and, you know, their heart beat starts racing and their blood pressure goes up. And I get the emails from my clients. I got this letter. I don't know what to do. And this is very common. If you claim donation receipts or medical expenses or the child care deduction or any of these, you know, deductions and credits that you're allowed to claim, well, the CRA has to verify the claim. And it makes sense. We can't have a system where they don't do any verification because then everyone would just claim every single deduction and credit and no one would pay any tax. So obviously they have to do random checks and audits, but the way the letters are worded from the CRA can be very scary um, for, a, for a taxpayer to receive that letter. And Jerry, um, what happens in the book, and this has happened to clients of mine, all, this happens all the time, sometimes the, the taxpayer never receives the letter. And then a few months later, 
they got a reassessment denying the claim that they made for whichever deduction or credit that they claimed. And they receive a reassessment with a balance owing. Now you owe tax because we're denying your claim for donation receipts or medical expenses. But the original letter requesting to see the documentation was never even received. That happens all the time. So it's very scary for people to receive a letter from CRA saying you owe $1,000, you owe $2,000. No, you, you know, most Canadians, at least half of Canadians are living paycheck to paycheck. They're, they're not budgeting for unexpected tax bills. But when you think about the way our tax system is designed, is that it's designed with, there's always unexpected tax bills, but, but you can't budget for that. So it, it's just another example of how inefficient the tax system is, because every deduction or credit that exists in our tax system means you have to have departments filled with employees at CRA verifying these deductions and credits. Um, you have to have taxpayers hiring people like me, grumpy accountants and other people to help them send in the information in a timely manner. And of course, the taxpayer, him or herself, you have to keep all your receipts for and all your documents for, you have to keep them for six years on file in case the CRA has to see them. And I just think that's an unreasonable level of bureaucracy that millions and millions of Canadians have to deal with. It's not like it's only the top 1%. It's any and every Canadian that files an income tax return and claims a deduction or credit. We're expected to become like record keepers and bookkeepers and, and just deal with this whole bureaucratic system. And the more years I spent doing this job, the more I realized none of this is, should really be necessary. Like we could just eliminate the deductions and credits, you lower the tax rate, so it's like revenue neutral. And then we can just be free to live our lives without having to keep receipts, worrying about CRA audits and reassessments and delays in our refunds and balances owing. And, and that's what I'm saying. I think the whole entire system needs to be reviewed comprehensively and really simplified um, in its totality. I'm actually going to take your rant a step further. Not only do you have to deal with the whole bureaucratic mess of all of the paperwork and all of that, as taxpayers... We get to pay for it with the CRA, all of the bureaucrats there, we're paying their salaries so they can nitpick through documents from five years ago. But let's just deal with the brass tacks of the moment. If you get that brown envelope, you find out you're being audited. I assume your advice isn't to immediately panic, although that's what most of us would do. What do you do? What do you do when you get that brown envelope and you realize you're getting audited? Yeah, you just, first of all, just calm down. It's not a big deal. For most people, they're just very standard reviews of the claims you made. It's not like a comprehensive audit of your entire life. It's just saying if you made, if you claim donations, charitable donations in your tax return, now you just have to send copies of the receipts to the CRA. It's not a big deal. Um, so I always tell people, don't make a claim for a deduction of credit if you don't have the receipt or if you won't be able to track down the receipt. Um, Because why put yourself in that position, right? As long as you have the documentation, you just send it into them. And they're actually like better now The usually their letter says you have 30 days to send it in, you can call and get an, another 30 day extension. So really you have 60 days. And I think now actually you don't even have to call, they automatically give you the 60 days so you can call and get even another 30 days. And, and I write this in the book also, the vast majority of people who work at the CRA, they want to help. They're friendly. They're doing their job. They don't want to come after you and screw you over. Um, they're well-meaning and they want to help. So there's nothing to be afraid of or scared of um, for most taxpayers who have simple situations and are receiving very simple audit letters just to review, you know, a couple credits or deductions. People who are business owners and claim a lot of business expenses, that's when you start to get into more complexity, HST audits and payroll audits, things like that. That's where it's more complicated and there's more to worry about. Uh, but for the majority of people, there's nothing really to worry about. Keep your receipts, keep all your documents, um, keep them scanned in. You're allowed to keep scanned copies. And when the CRA asks to see, you can just actually submit it now online right through something called My Account. So if you Google CRA, My Account, you should set it up and um, you could submit documents right through there. All right. So that that's a calming influence. That's a good thing. We're going to have some grumpiness here, but let's at least be calmly grumpy. 
Well, let's take another uh, step in, in Jerry's uh, life here. He realizes uh, that it's not just money coming off of his paycheck and going to the government. There's also checks coming back. Again, that does, that's counterintuitive. If I'm paying you, why are you paying me at the same time? What in the world is going on there? Yeah, so the government sends out, I actually looked up the federal budget because I was doing research for the book and I wanted to know the actual numbers. So the federal government spends about $80 billion a year. Now this is pre-COVID, okay? Um, And that's about one fifth of their budget. So I think it was fiscal year um, 2018-19 or maybe it was 2019-20. I forget, but total federal spending was about $300 billion and 80 billion of that is direct transfers to individuals, GST credits, old age security, guaranteed income supplement, and the big one, Canada child benefits. So what happens to Jerry in the book is he starts receiving these checks for like $90 every three months, these GST credit checks, and he doesn't know what it is. And George explains to him, if your income is below a certain level, you receive these credits and it's tax free money. But Jerry's confused because he's paying thousands of dollars of income tax and he's receiving a little bit back every three months. So there is like this inherent inefficiency. And the same thing goes for kind of child benefits. If your family income is less than $200,000, you will receive kind of child benefits. And the lower your income is, the more you receive. Now, that creates a whole other set of problems um, in terms of perverse incentives in our system. But I always find it, it's pretty ridiculous. Like my family, like we receive kind of child benefits every month, but I'm paying way more in tax than I'm receiving. Like I don't need that money. All I need is a reduction in income tax and then we could keep things simple. So most people are at a threshold where like, yeah, the people who are, earning very low incomes. They're not really paying a lot of income tax or they're paying zero and they're receiving back some of these credits. That makes sense, at least from a like efficiency perspective, right? Now, if you're paying a ton of, like if your family income is let's say $150,000 and you're paying tens of thousands of dollars of income tax, you don't need $200 a month in Canada child benefits. It To me, it seems like a gimmick and it's politicians, that are like, they like to give people money because it makes them look good. And people, every month, they see that come into their bank account and they think, oh, I love the government. I love my Canada Child Benefits. I'm going to keep voting for this party that increased it, right? And and both of the major parties have done this. It's not like only one has done it. They both have. Um, and they both keep doing it because it's popular with voters. But it doesn't make sense to me that we have this, you, you know, of the federal budget is just giving money back to people that other, I guess, I mean, this is part of the redistribution, but a lot of people are at a higher income paying more tax than they receive back. Why not just um, calculate like the rate, calculate the difference, eliminate the benefits for those people, but then you could lower their tax rate and then we could have a much more efficient system. Because what happens is the CRA will audit your eligibility for Canada Child Benefits. Um, And I've seen this happen, especially when people get separated or divorced and which spouse gets to claim the benefits. They have these audits and people's benefits get held up and they're relying on that money. So it creates a whole set of problems. And again, the administrative costs of this at the CRA and Service Canada to administer these benefits, um, it's not cheap. And of course, people have to... They don't know how do I apply? Do I have to apply? When do I apply? And it, it's just, it's too complicated. So I try to show in the book, maybe uh, simpler ways of doing this, where we're still helping people who need the help, but we're not sending, you know, a hundred dollars a month to someone earning $150,000 a year, who's paying $50,000 of income tax. All right, let's, let's move along to another point in Jerry's life. There's like a good news, bad news scenario. He gets a raise. <laughs> great work he's been doing a good job he gets a little bump at work but now he realizes he's in a higher tax bracket so he's going to get hammered on taxes so he goes to george in a bit of a panic what do i do do i turn down the raise take us through that scenario what does uh, the grumpy accountant george tell him 
Yeah, George explains to him, don't turn down the raise. Um, a lot of people, they don't understand the way marginal tax brackets work. There is actually a member of parliament. I forget the name. I think I know the name, but I don't want to say the name because I'm not 100% sure. But I think it was a year ago or, you know, in the past two years, there was a big kind of uh, sort of embarrassing little scandal because he, he stood up in the House of Commons and, was, and they were talking about the tax rates. And he was saying, no one should have to, like, he basically thought that all your income is taxed at 50%. He didn't understand. No, you go through, everyone goes through the tax brackets and only income above a certain amount is taxed at the higher rate. So let's say your salary is you know $45,000 and your boss offers you a $5,000 raise. Even if that pushes that extra $5,000 might be taxed at a slightly higher rate, but your first 45,000 is still taxed at the low rates. You still go through those brackets. So it's only the additional money. So George tells him, of course, you should take the bonus. And even though your salary is higher, so now your CPP and your EI is also higher. You're going to have more deductions um, for CPP and EI and income tax, but on a net basis, it's still worth it. Um, now, that's when you're in lower brackets. Some people feel like right now in Canada, seven out of 10 provinces have a top marginal tax rate, the highest bracket of over 50%, five zero. So people in those brackets, no one really likes paying uh, more than 50 cents on the dollar of to income tax. And by the way, even my clients who... I have very frank discussions with that are very maybe left-leaning type voters. Even they don't like paying those tax rates and um, no one really does, right? So if you know that you're going to receive a bonus, I had this once with a client who was a lawyer at a big downtown Toronto law firm and they wanted to give him, uh, they gave him a bonus. He worked all these extra hours and you know how these law firms work. They book a bonus based on your billable hours. And they had, they told him, you know, we need to deduct tax 53.4%. He's like, what? 53%. And, and the payroll department at the law firm was correct. And he felt that that was just like so hard for him to take uh, because he worked all those extra hours, time away from his family, and it would have been worth it for him to receive the whole bonus, but to only get 47%, he felt, you know what, next year, forget it. Why would I work those extra hours? It's not worth it. My time for it, if I'm only getting 47% of it, it's just not worth it. So people in those, once you're in the highest tax bracket, once it hits over 50%, people think about it differently. It's, there's a psychological barrier that happens. So, but people in the lower brackets, if you're not at that rate yet or in your lower bracket, you should never turn down the raise um, because only the additional amount is taxed at the higher rate. There's a little bit more good news in the book. Jerry and Elaine, they finally get together. They get married. It's all very happy. But here again, George the Grumpy Accountant, even that. Even Jerry and Elaine finally getting together. George the Grumpy Accountant, he is not happy about it from a tax perspective. How can he be mad about that? How can George be grumpy about that? Well, he's happy for them personally. But when it comes to tax returns, married couples, it starts to get a little bit more complicated because each spouse still has to file their own tax return. We don't have joint filing here, um, like in some other countries where you can file jointly. Here, every spouse still files their own individual tax return, but you have to show that you're married. You have to show your marital status. You have to show the SIN number and date of birth and net income of your spouse. And then there's a whole bunch of deductions and credits that you can actually choose which spouse gets to claim. So it makes the tax filing process a little bit more complicated. Um, and especially also once people start having kids, it also gets a little more complicated. And there's people with you know more kind of higher levels of income, they have some complicated opportunities maybe to save on their overall tax bill. So there's like spousal RRSPs and there's other things people could do, interest-free look or not interest-free, but interest-bearing loans from a high-income spouse to a low-income spouse in order to have the lower-income spouse invest money. And Jerry and Elaine are very confused because they thought, oh, we're married. Why don't we just file one tax return as a family and combine and split all our income? And George explains to them, no, pensioning, pension income splitting only exists for 
I think those who are maybe 55 or older or 60 or older, I forget, and they have certain types of income, pension income can be split, but it doesn't exist for working families. Um, so each spouse is still taxed individually, and that creates some weird consequences. So like you can have one family where one spouse is working and let's say earns $100,000 a year and the other spouse is earning zero. Now that family will have a higher tax bill, much higher tax bill than the family where each spouse earns 50,000 a year. The family income is the same, but because different people are earning it, the, the family where one spouse is working and one spouse isn't has a higher tax bill. It doesn't really make any sense. When you think about it, if most families combine their income, they combine their expenses, and we should really be taxed as family units, not as individuals. And in fact, over 50 years ago, the Carter Commission, which was the last time we had comprehensive tax reform in Canada, they actually recommended to tax families and not individuals. And the government did not listen to that recommendation in the report. So we still are taxed as individuals. But you see what the government double dips. And we don't like double dipping. Nobody likes double dipping, especially during COVID times. But when the government gives, out, gives you your Canada child benefits, they calculate it based on your combined family income. Now, you can't have it both ways. Well, I guess the government can, and they do, because your tax bill is based on individual income. Kind of the child benefits that you get to, when the government needs to pay you, oh, now we'll use family income, right? Because they really, what they're admitting by saying that, and same thing with GST credits, they're saying that family income is the true indicator of your financial situation. Because we're not going to pay you kind of the child benefits if your family income is too high. But why, why don't they go by individual income, right? Because they know family income is, is how you measure families' financial situation. But when it comes to your income tax bill that you pay, it's still based on individual income. So the whole topic of marriage and taxes makes the grumpy accountant very grumpy. Now, of course, any story about a person's life, uh, there's the end stage of it as well. And you get into the part where Jerry... But don't, don't ruin, don't ruin what ha- I, I don't want to ruin the ending for people. So okay, okay. So there's spoiler that. alerts here. Just be careful, everybody. Uh, but Jerry does estate planning because he wants to pass on a legacy to his son, Soda. Uh, they've got to work that out. You'd think it'd be simple. You know, you have a will, you pass it on. Uh, young Soda has a nice start to life. But it's much, much more complicated than that. What is, tell that story. What does that look like? It's very complicated. Um, apparently, I forget the exact percentage but there's too many Canadians that don't have a will. That's a big mistake. Everyone should have a will. Um, in some provinces, in fact, if you don't have a will and it's the government actually becomes a beneficiary to some of your money and your assets. So probably most people don't want that. Um, so yeah, in Jerry's situation in the book, um, Soda, Jerry's son, who's named Soda, he doesn't understand the idea that when somebody... Um, passes on, on that date that they pass away, there's actually what we call in the, t- in the magical world of tax, we call it a deemed disposition of your assets. So a lot of people in Canada think that we don't have a death tax in Canada, but that's not really accurate. Um, for people who die and have assets that they own, all those assets are considered to be sold on the date that someone passes away. We call it a deemed disposition. Disposition meaning sold, deemed. The government considers that you sold, you know, you didn't really sell them, right? You, it, nothing was sold, but it's like you sold them and you have to pay capital gains tax in that final tax return. Um, so a lot of families run into trouble, especially if they have a family business or they have real estate. Um, they don't realize, now principal residents would be exempt from that. But a lot of people don't understand that there's usually a tax bill to pay upon death. And some people don't know that. They don't plan for it. So what George recommends in the book, um, you have to plan for this in advance. Speak to an estate lawyer, an estate and wills lawyer, an accountant, people who are knowledgeable in this area. It's very complicated. um, And there's a lot of planning that needs to be done. But in the book, I guess 
you, the main points are that George gets really grumpy. He really doesn't like the idea of families being forced to pay tax on these like very, it's a very Orwellian concept when you think about it. It's paying a capital gains tax on an asset you haven't sold. So where does the money come from to pay that tax if you haven't sold the asset? And some people are forced to sell the asset in order to pay the bill or they make a payment plan with CRA and have to pay interest. Um, so it's, 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 it's a frustrating issue to deal with for sure. All right, I'm not gonna spoil the end. It's a good book. I want everybody to read to the end. But you wrote this book for a specific reason, because even though you're an accountant, even though a lot of your business comes from the complexity of the tax code, you want it to be more simple. Why is it so important to you to simplify the tax code? Well, I've been doing this, you know, tax filing job for almost, or I guess over 10 years. Uh, I've been a designated accountant for seven, over seven years. And as I've learned how our tax system really works, I've realized, I've realized, and I've always questioned every single step of my job. Like every task that I do, I question like, wait a minute, is this necessary? Like, why do we have to, why do we really have to do this? And there's so many examples of that. So the reason why it's important to me is because I don't want millions and that's not an exaggeration. It's, it's, there's 28 million Canadians who file a tax return every year. So if the population is 37 million, if you exclude children and those under 19 years old or who aren't working or whatever, you have 28 million tax filers. The majority of those are employees who receive a T4 slip and don't have any other income. Why are we putting 20 whatever million people through this tax filing exercise every year? Where they have to spend money, whether they do it themselves and they only spend 20 or 40 60 or $60 on downloading tax software, or they spend a few hundred dollars a year on an accountant. Why are we putting people through that? Canadians spend $7 billion a year. That's just households on filing their tax returns. That's an average of $500 per family to get their tax returns filed. That doesn't include businesses and corporations and small businesses. And the series budget is almost, it's reaching almost $5 billion a year. It, it, it just, it bothers me that we're putting people through this. I think about this issue all the time and I would frequently complain to my wife about it every day after I finished work. And she got very tired of that. And she suggested, why don't you write, write some articles, uh, write a blog or something about these issues. And as I started doing that, I realized there's a whole book here. And I looked at the Canadian tax book market and I saw that there was no other book quite like this. So I, I felt really an obligation to, to write the grumpy accountant. Yeah, here's the thing that's a no brainer. The government needs to simplify the tax code. Mm -hmm. The idea that yeah. you're paying a bunch of tax and then get, <laughs> having checks crossing in the mail where you're getting checks back, that's crazy. There's no question in the world that we could simplify the tax code tremendously. And your mm -hmm. book does an outstanding job of um, showing the absurdity of a lot of the things that a lot of us have gotten used to. We don't even check our pay stubs. We don't even think about what our gross income is compared to our, uh, <laughs> our actual take home pay. It's, yeah. uh, it's kind of ridiculous when you, you really think about it. And also if you ask, if you were to stop a random person on the street and ask them, how much do you pay in rent every month? How much is your mortgage payment every month? How much is your phone bill? How much is your car payment? They'll be able to answer you on the spot, right? Now ask them this. How much income tax did you pay in 2019? Uh, what? Like no one, people don't know. And they wouldn't even know where on the tax return to look that up. Because most tax returns, if you print your tax return to a PDF file, it's going to be 30, 40, 50 pages. And people don't even know where to look that up. So people don't think about, like ask them, yeah, how much was your, the, they'll actually know how much their gross pay was. They know what their salary is, right? But ask them, how much was your net pay? How much CPP did you pay? How much EI did you pay? How much income tax did you pay? They have no idea. Um, so it, it, it's a problem. There's like this kind of just too much complexity that nobody understands it. And I think that's a big problem. There's a lot of gray areas in our tax system. I would say over half the time questions I receive from my clients, I have to answer them like, 
okay, let me check, you know, it's a gray area. It's not so clear. I'm going to t- check with the tax specialist. Hold on a second. And then I come back to him. It's like, okay, maybe this, maybe it's very, some questions are very simple. Okay. Can I deduct my g- adult gym membership? No, you cannot deduct that. Okay. That's simple. Fine. But there's a lot of gray area. Um, how do you define a resident of Canada? I mean, you think it's pretty simple if you live in Canada. Well, that's not so simple. I mean, what does it mean to live in a country, right? So it's so, every aspect of our tax system is too complicated and it, it, it needs a revamp. We haven't had comprehensive tax reform in over 50 years. It was 1967 when the Carter Commission report was released. We haven't done anything since then um, in a major way because I think it's just too much of a controversial thing. I think politicians are afraid of it. Now, the CRA, to their credit, they've gotten better with technology. So my account online is great. Autofill, like you can, you can download TurboTax or you file or go to simpletax.ca or studio tax. And you can actually autofill your tax return with information CRA already has on file. So I think that's a good thing. But you still have to be careful and double check because sometimes they don't have every slip and sometimes they have a slip that you don't have and you don't know how it got there. I think we need to do a lot more and that would really involve what I call depoliticizing the tax system, which sounds so counterintuitive. But we have to have a system where politicians can't keep adding in new deductions and credits every year. Every time there's a change in government, they eliminate the deductions and credits from the previous government, and then they put in, uh, in their own credits and deductions that align with the values of their particular political party. Um, and it just creates a huge mess. And people are tired of it. Um, so, and I'm tired of it. And I know... I've, 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 the feedback I've been receiving from the book is that I, most people agree with the notion that we need a simpler tax system. Now, we might disagree on other issues like how much tax should Canadians pay? Are you paying too much tax, too little tax? Okay, we'll do, people will always disagree about that. But everyone should agree from like the most um, socialist, Marxist, communist to the most crazy libertarian. Everyone should agree. At least let's, have, let's keep it simple. Why don't we make it simpler? And that's what the book is about. And it's a good book. Like I said, uh, it's informative. I learned things uh, about the tax system. I understood it better. There was actually stuff even with my personal finance, like, ah, I should double check that. So mm. it's really useful and helpful that way. But better yet, and most importantly to me, because I don't read things that I don't enjoy, it was really funny. I actually was laughing out loud to write something that's informative about taxes and funny that's quite a literary accomplishment. Neil Winokur, the grumpy accountant, he got it done. Go check on Amazon, bookstores, anywhere, thegrumpyaccountant.ca. I think I got that right. Um, grumpy, without the the, grumpyaccountant.ca. Grumpyaccountant.ca. Pick yeah. up the book. It's funny. You're going to learn something and you'll probably save money on your tax return next time around uh, because you know a little bit more about it. So, Neil, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you very much.